You're listening to Inside Public Procurement by Bonfire, a show celebrating the unique stories and heroic efforts of those on the front lines of public procurement. Each episode, we bring you the latest trends, tips, and real stories from procurement trailblazers like you, who work tirelessly to bring positive impact to the agencies and communities you serve. Together, let's elevate the field of public procurement to new heights. Now, pull up a chair and let's gather around the bonfire. Our show is about to begin. Hello and welcome to Inside Public Procurement Podcast. My name is Rachel Friesen and I am the Director of Client Experience at Bonfire, an e-procurement solution used by over 500 public agencies in North America. I'm joined today by Craig Milley, Principal Consultant at Wayfinder Consulting. Craig is an international leader in procurement with an impressive track record of executing major procurement reforms and bringing innovative methods and ideas to successive organizations. Craig recently served as the first ever Director Central Procurement Office for the Cayman Islands government. Prior to that, he was the Head of Procurement for the City of Lethbridge, Alberta. In 2013, his Lethbridge team was the sole recipient of a National Peer Reviewed Award for Leadership in Public Procurement for groundbreaking work using competitive dialogue on large-scale capital projects. Craig relocated to Victoria, BC in 2018 and established a boutique consulting firm aimed at helping his clients improve their procurement processes and deliver results for their organization. Most recently, he has been supporting a variety of clients, including principal government ministries, local municipalities in BC and Ontario, and the largest public library system in BC. Thank you so much for joining me today, Craig. Well, thanks, uh, Rachel. Thanks for having me. Uh, It's great to be with you. Oh, of course. And I always like to, you know, pose a question before we get started. More or less, this one, like, what are you, you know, most looking forward to post-COVID? I know that's relative to region, but what's on the, the horizon for you? Well, certainly for for me and my family, we, uh, we miss the travel aspect probably the most. Uh, with COVID, of course, we're, we're hunkered down here and we're, we're fortunate here on Vancouver Island. Uh, and it's been one of the, you know, the safe places probably in the country and in the world. So we, we haven't ventured far. So after two years of being on Vancouver Island, we're, we're feeling a little uh, island bound and looking forward to uh, to travel at some point when it's safe and you know somewhere nice and warm and sunny and maybe with a beach that would be a preferable yeah no fair enough i can see the victoria beach is not testing the the time of winter <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah we're we're fortunate we've got the ocean pretty close to us here but it's a right. tad bit colder than certainly what we were used to in the in the caribbean you know it it's always nice to travel to and that's sort of been yeah. our our family thing we we took our kids when they were little on their first trip to mexico and people have thought we were a little crazy at the time but they've grown up to be <laughs> travelers as well so yeah that's kind of our go-to thing as a family so yeah we we miss that no that's great Hopefully we'll get down south soon enough and up the degrees a few levels <laughs> to, <laughs> yeah. to push through. And then so we'll actually get into, I always love to start with, because everyone has such a varied past of how they ended up in purchasing or procurement. So for you, Craig, and obviously, you know, you're even the, actually, you know what, I'm not going to tell your story for you. How are you able to share your journey of, you know, what led you to, into procurement? Yeah, I'm I'm pretty typical in, in terms, you know, the story always begins, I never intended to do this, right? It, you know, I, I've talked to many procurement folks over the years, and I, I too love to hear the stories of, you know, how musicians become procurement officers and and people from <laughs> right. all walks of life. Uh, certainly, I um, mine is is much more mundane. I uh, I left university and I'm dating myself now. Back in in the late '80s, uh, during what was unfortunately the the largest recession ever since the uh, mm. the Great Depression, and I left university majored in poli sci and history and a minor in business admin. So there wasn't a lot of prospects waiting for me. And as I discovered. And uh, and I had always planned to back and do graduate work. Well, funny thing is, on the way to that journey, things changed. So I got a job. Uh, I, I went to work in retail, and it was literally mm-hmm. just started on a night fill crew stocking shelves overnight in a large, uh, well-known Canadian retailer and ended up staying for 15 years. But what I learned back in those days and certainly helped me as the years went on, and I discovered the wonderful world of retail and been worked in every aspect of it 
But what I really enjoyed and, and sort of what led me to procurement is in retail, we call a distinguish between the front of house and the back of house operations. Mm -hmm. And for me, the back of house was kind of where it was at. I was kind of bored, you know, doing mm -hmm. the the sales part and, you know, being out there on in the public eye every day. And uh, But I loved how business operated in the back room. So I was fortunate. I got mentored at a young age and taught inventory and operations in particular. So I started out literally doing ordering and then we got into, you know, seasonal ordering and special mm -hmm. ordering and, you know, had a wonderful education in terms of all of that. So I ended up staying, like I say, and then all of a sudden, one day there was an ad in the paper and I was looking at the newspaper and back in the day when we read newspapers and saw the ad for the city of Lethbridge <laughs> mm -hmm. and noted it to my wife who was sitting beside me. And I said, oh, that's kind of interesting and proceeded mm -hmm. to put the paper down. And my wife stopped and looked at me and she's like, aren't you going to apply? And I'm like, oh, they'll never hire me. And she said, well, not if you don't apply. And so I picked mm. the thing up again for the second time. And I said, well, maybe they'll, they'll interview me and maybe the next time they'll, they'll remember me. Many years later, that was 20 years ago. And, um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've been doing it ever since. So it's, it's just one of those things where, you know, you, you don't set out to go in a certain direction, but it kind of finds you. And probably as much as anyone, I've probably found where I need to be or where I should be or where I ought to be. So, right. Yeah. No, but that range of exposure in retail is obviously advantageous. And then obviously credit's due to your wife a bit here, <laughs> which is great as a catalyst. <laughs> I always thank her. And she, she reminds me from time to time about the, do you remember that? And I'm like, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and I still have the uh, the job posting and the, the newspaper ad that I've kept it ever oh, since. And, perfect. Yeah. Oh, Take really? Oh, that's great. Yeah she's, yeah, she's like, don't let your memory change things retrospectively. Let's remember what <laughs> truly yeah. went, what, what occurred. <laughs> yeah. It's, oh, my uh, goodness. Sometimes our, our partners know us better than ourselves. Uh, yeah. Oh, I would agree with that very much. So in a confronting sense, <laughs> on that note to you, because you've had a range of experiences that I highlighted, obviously, in your biography, but I'm curious, like what made you take the jump to create Wayfinder? And I hope you're going to touch on the name. I'm curious, actually, I can make assumptions, but I'm curious why you called your firm Wayfinder Consulting too. Yeah, yeah. Wayfinder uh, it was always, a, uh, and I chose it specifically. So for me, Wayfinding and I, having worked with engineers and architects for many years, and I always knew Wayfinding from the, you know, sort of part of the that world and and particularly with airports and if you've ever been in an airport and you walk into these massive concourses and you have no idea of, you know how to get to gate B7 all you have to go on are the signs along the way so i've always been intrigued by this notion that we could take a very complex process if you think about what public procurement is but try and present it in a way that allows for the average person not mm -hmm. to get lost. So that was kind of the mm -hmm. inspiration and uh, Wayfinder, where that comes from. And I think in all honesty, too, at the time, my daughter was a big fan of Moana, uh, one of the Disney stories. And, and there was uh, there was some really interesting symbology, I'll call it, in Moana about traveling over the ocean and being navigating by the stars. And they were considered oh, Wayfinders. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So anyway, uh, that's kind of my goal has always been to try and help my clients, my people, to help them navigate through what is a very complex and very complicated sometimes process. So, so yeah, I, when I came to Victoria, moved back from the Caribbean in 2018, all I knew is I wasn't going back to cold prairie winters. So I ended up uh, <laughs> coming here to Victoria and I made a conscious decision not to go in-house and go to work for a singular employer anymore. And uh, I'd always mm -hmm. wanted to, to get into the consulting world and thought it would be later mm -hmm. in, in life when my kids were done university and sort of pre-retirement, but such is life and, you know, things come to us and I'm a big believer now in opportunities. And when, when that door opens, uh, you, you better step yep. in. So, uh, so yeah, I, I love, I work with many organizations and, you know, from provincial government ministries to small municipalities and many different 
types of organizations in between. I'll do a little bit of policy review and reform. Obviously, I've done a lot of that over the years. I work on major projects with some of my clients. And then sometimes I'm backfilling for folks in these smaller organizations or adding, uh, being an additional resource so I can, you know, I can sort of be their pinch hitter, I like to call it. I'm a baseball Mm -hmm. fanatic. So, uh, (laughs) uh, you know, I, I like to come in and help them out as best I can. And then my other uh, gig is I work with organizations I'm a big believer in, and I provide a full e-auction service to some clients as well, doing reverse Mm -hmm. auction services. So that all keeps me very engaged and working and, yeah, keeps me busy and out of trouble as well. Yeah, (laughs) I know. That's great. We'll have to do another podcast just focused on your e-auction expertise or a webinar or whatnot, because I know that's always an interesting topic for, or at least I'll say for my firsthand exposure with our organizations we support, where there's always appetite for auctions, but it feels like an enormity to actually take on from like a scoping yeah, yeah. of their process standpoint. So one day we'll, I'll basically, I'm, um, what's the word? I'm foreshadowing <laughs> for a future act. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great topic <laughs> and, and uh, you know, one that it's always interesting in, in the Canadian context. So yeah, I've, I've become a real believer in it and, you know, it, it's something absolutely love to chat about it again at another time. Oh, okay, great. No, definitely. So we're actually going to go into a few questions and just for everyone listening to this is a bit more of a focused episode. So we're going to be diving in um, now with Craig and based on his expertise, you know, around vendor paid models. And so actually on that note too, from your perspective or, you know, industry standard, Craig, like what does vendor paid e-procurement typically mean? Yeah. And I think there's, uh, you know, it's one of those uh, topics that there's probably a few different models out there, but typically, uh, you know, uh, when I, I think about it, it's just any time where they're, uh, you know, vendors are essentially paying for access to bid opportunities, whether they're the the sole financial supporter, you know, subscriber to these systems, or whether they're paying a per document fee. There's a number of different methods out there. But certainly, yeah, it's a conscious decision, I think, for an owner to say, you know, the vendors will pay for this, not my organization as the owner. Yeah, no, exactly. That overarchingly fits pretty much all the, all the models, or all the models have that as a common characteristic. And then mm-hmm. I know for yourself, I guess two questions for you. Have you ever been at an agency where you utilize a tool with that model? And then if you haven't, like, but based on your exposure to, you know, from the past, your network, in addition to Wayfinder, like, why might an agency find these sorts of vendor paid models appealing in general? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And that's a that's a great question. And, and it's not a, you know, certainly I'll preface uh, my comments. It, it's never right or wrong decision. I think each organization mm-hmm. comes to that decision on their own. But certainly I've never been in a position and I've implemented an, a number of e-procurement systems in the last 20 years. And in none of those cases where they ever a vendor pay model. But it doesn't mean that there aren't instances where there may be a need for that. And, and certainly the one that comes to mind for organizations sometimes is the cost, simply the cost of uh, mm-hmm. uh, putting a system in place. And in particular, uh, and this one we've probably seen recently, and I'm sure Bonfire experienced this, uh, you know, these systems are so easily accessed these days. And during COVID, for example, you know, there was an awful lot of organizations who may have been late adopters to e-procurement would have had to, mm-hmm. you know, ramp up and get systems in place really quickly, likely. And I've worked in municipalities for many years. I know what budgets are like, and I know how these processes work. And, you know, unless you have you got into the queue for budget the previous year, all of a sudden, sudden you've got to put a system in place and you've got no money to do it. So in those those instances, mm-hmm. I could see where, you know, it's a choice of having no e-procurement functionality whatsoever, or we have to put the burden on the vendor community to get us going with this. And, and it's unfortunate, but it certainly it could happen and it likely has happened. But it does, uh, you know, and it's enticing. And certainly even in the times I've implemented e-procurement, you know, you, you go through that decision making process internally of, well, who pays the cost of this? And the organizations I've been part of, it's always been a philosophy that this is something that is for the organization, us as the owner to bear this cost and not mm-hmm. impose this on the vendor community. It is a it is a complex issue, but certainly, you know, it's something each organization has to carefully consider. Right. No, I, I like how you're mentioning it. it's not just in a one size fits all. Like there's a level of criticality and foresight with 
for example, COVID, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, the budgets just weren't outlined. They weren't outlined. From your perspective too, since you were more on the side of, you know, our, the organization, if possible, should bear the cost. Was there certain, with that logic, was it because there were certain risks you perceived with the vendor paid model? I wasn't, I wasn't sure there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, and certainly the, the discovery and the analysis we went through internally was certainly trying to improve our own processes internally mm-hmm. and trying to make things easier for the vendors, for the bidders. And part of that thinking was we really ought not to upset, I'll use that terminology upset the vendor community or impose something new on them. You know, depending on the organization, sometimes the relationship is not necessarily great between the the public buying entity and the vendor community. But certainly risk like you could be depressing the participation rate, you could reduce the bidder pool. Mm -hmm. Small communities certainly having operated procurement systems in mid-size, not small towns and villages, but certainly, you know, a city of 100,000 people is still a small town and a small marketplace for suppliers. So the other thing, you know, to keep in mind, and I know Bonfire is big on metrics and studying this, and I, I believe, and I can't remember the exact number, but even nowadays, the average number of bids per opportunity is, you know, is barely over three, three bids per RFP or tender that goes out there. And when you think about that, that's, there's not a long ways between three and one one, which is not where anyone wants this to go. So I think that's something, you know, we have to be be careful of. The other thing I think uh, certainly folks that I worked with over the years were also worried about making the organization less attractive to the vendor community. Mm -hmm. If there are other organizations in neighboring communities just across the, the city, somebody else doesn't charge for bid documents, you might see a tendency for people to migrate to bid on somebody else's. And and certainly, you know, I'll, I'll talk about the impact of relationships between suppliers and owners. And, you know, we're, we've been fortunate here in Canada and most places, and, you know, certainly there's exceptions, but generally the relationship is strong. I think there's a, a healthy respect there. And despite the, we see these hiccups from time to time in the newspaper, but I think fundamentally the relationship's strong. But I, I've got firsthand experience working in a community where the relationship had broken down. One of the things when I first went to the Cayman Islands, and for your listeners, the, I ended up being hired to come in and reform the procurement process in the Cayman Islands. Uh, they had gone through, a, like many organizations, a, a major auditor general's report, which obviously had not produced a positive finding. And one of the things I found when I got there was the relationship really had broken down between the government and the supplier community. Again, Mm -hmm. a smaller community, 65,000 people, small supplier base, and the relationship that we value in Canada here based on trust and respect, it really had broken there and the vendors were not trustful of the government and the government probably had squandered a lot of goodwill with the uh, the vendor community. So it, it's something that I took a, a lot of lessons from having to navigate through that. So I spent an awful lot of time in my time there in Cayman, three and a half years, working with the local Chamber of Commerce, vendor outreach, meeting with suppliers, hearing them out. And Mm -hmm. certainly part of our even, and I implemented a a e-procurement bonfire in uh, Cayman Islands. And, And part of that discussion internally was, do we bear the cost of this? And certainly in an mm-hmm. instance like that, it would it would have been foolish for us to try and impose a vendor pay model in that environment. But the vendors, once they understood that we were putting a system in, they really were the champions for my initiative because they really saw it as a transparency benefit for them. You know, all of a sudden they could rely on a secure system that gave them proof of delivery. And it just took the relationship back on track, not to say that that single-handedly fixed that, but it certainly was an important element in the equation. And I also think the other uh, final point I'll make on this is uh, when the owner is paying for the system, with that, I think, comes some ability to influence the maybe the long-term direction. Maybe sometimes it's simple mm-hmm. functionality. And I think that's something we should always keep in mind is uh, it's something that we as 
public procurement officers bear is we should always be trying to make this thing work better for our end users and for our vendors. So being able to have that ability to communicate requests for changes, for tweaks, I would worry that if, mm -hmm. you know, if I wasn't party to that, I might have less ability to influence that. No, it is a key point. And I need to be careful in like what I say here in the sense of we do value our vendor feedback, for example, from Bonfire on like how we can evolve the tool. But it's definitely through the lens too of like what our organizations are saying their vendors are mm -hmm. like, what, like there's very much that prioritization of we serve the organizations that quite literally pay for for Bonfire. And from there as an extension, you know, your stakeholders are your vendors and your evaluators. So how are we making their experiences as good as possible to streamline your process? But it is definitely through like the lens and the eye of the vendors priorities, sorry, the buyers priorities, and then getting the feedback from the suppliers. No, it, it's a key point to make it. It does really from a financial perspective, like influence a product direction as well. Mm -hmm. No, you hit some very interesting points there too, in the sense of your Cayman Islands experience as well. And you mentioned you brought in Bonfire there. So obviously people know that you were a user of Bonfire at some point <laughs> in time. That's of course, I should have mentioned at the beginning how Craig and I, I was actually his, let's say Bonfire go-to for a period of time yeah. before he, he left the island. And then on that note too, you'd mentioned transparency from your suppliers and your vendor's perspective or vendor's buy-in. Those are two criteria that you factored in, you know, when you were looking for a solution. Were there other elements or variables that you took into consideration that you, you think are worth highlighting for your search for any procurement tool? Yeah, and those, uh, you know, those are important. Uh, obviously, the functionality itself. I, I remember when I first learned about Bonfire a number of years ago now, you know, and certainly it, it was a product that I immediately liked because of the functionality. But there's one thing, and I, and I always call it the Amazon test. And mm -hmm. when I say that, it, I've always appreciated the fact that Bonfire is intuitive. So I've always said if you can to evaluators in particular and, and you know vendors registering, if you can if you can navigate and buy something for yourself on Amazon, no plug for them, but any any online retailer, <laughs> you can, you know, yeah. I just call it the Amazon test, but uh, uh, you know, no, it, I, it, it's I, got we get the, it's got the look and yeah, feel. And Amazon, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I feel like Amazon has all the promotions it needs, but no, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We need to give Bezos any more uh, any more plugs. Yeah. Uh, but but certainly the the ease of use and the and the simplicity of use and you know whether it's drop downs and radio buttons and you know it's just it's the stuff that's in our DNA now you know the stuff that my children grew up with and it's it's hardwired in them now and old guys like me had to learn that but you know it it is an important consideration when you're training an entire community on whether it's the supplier community or internal users. And that's back in the days when you and I were doing a lot of those in-service sessions. You know, it, it, I think people right. people appreciate that. It, it is, it's simple to use and, and it's intuitive. So that's kind of what I've always looked for is obviously all of the, uh, the obvious things we need and, you know, good customer support and security and the functionality, but does it pass that test? No, it's a key point because at the end of the day, no one tool will solve all of this, an organization's problems. It's like how people adopt the tool, right? So mm -hmm. it's good that you hold that as a high bar, that usability, that interface, should I say. Yeah, and how accessible it is. No, that's a great point. Yeah, I definitely remember the trainings we did. That takes me back. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> yeah. great. To your point about the, uh, the single tool as well, I think as a um, survivor, of a large scale ERP implementation a number of years ago, I can certainly say if the answer was in one large system to do everything for us, ERPs would still be the flavor of the day. And, <laughs> and I think we've, we've all realized that they have a role and a place and a, and a time, but they, yeah. one system cannot do everything. And we really do need these best of breed type uh, technologies that are out there. And, and Bonfire is certainly one of the, one of the best. Yeah, no, I know, I definitely, you know, evidently someone who's a bit biased and the best in breed, but I completely, it's interesting because most people who are not as favorable for ERPs, like it's definitely they were, went through the implementation once upon a time. <laughs> so there's that lived experience, essentially, yep. that seems to need to create the, the learnings and the empathy <laughs> for the situation. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my goodness. But on that note too, though, or not even that note, because I, I was going to say somehow we completely went through 
all the questions, which is fantastic. Thank you for the vendor paid focus we had today. But I still wanted to close out with a typical exit question in the sense of like, what is the number one piece of advice you'd give to people starting their career in public procurement? Yeah, and that's uh, that's always, uh, I don't often get this opportunity, so I'll distill it down to probably two simple concepts. Is And this is something I learned over the years. One is uh, never stop challenging accepted wisdom, receive wisdom, just always be questioning. And I had a professor in university many years ago, and he said, if I can teach anything, it's just question everything. Don't believe everything you read or hear. So certainly, you know, as a procurement officer, I think that's critical. Just having that mindset, you know, always be curious and, you know, always be analyzing even sometimes even your own thoughts. And then the the final one I, I would say is embrace continuous improvement. We can always do better. And certainly any procurement organization I've been a part of, one part of what I do on a daily basis is just scrutinize the process continuously and just, you know, looking for any opportunity to improve it. I think when we get to the point that we think our process and our procurement program is all there and it's done, that's probably the wrong answer to arrive at. So, you know, that's just from the school of hard knocks is your clients, if you talk to your clients, talk to your evaluators, talk to your vendors, they'll give you the God honest truth. And sometimes that's hard to take. But I think as procurement professionals, that's incumbent upon us to always be looking to see how we can do this better. I write a, an RFP today. I look at it a month from now and I look at it and go, mm, that could have been, I could have done better mm -hmm. on that. So that's kind of my approach to this very tricky business after all of these years. And it, it's never finished. That's just a work in mm -hmm. progress. That's fantastic advice. I love the growth mindset theme, if I may say. <laughs> On that mm -hmm. note, too, we will include a link as much as, not as much as we can, we will include a link to Wayfinder Consulting, a little bit of info where you, wherever you're listening to this podcast, whether it's Spotify, Apple, whatnot. But if there is an avenue in which people, if listeners did want to get in contact with you, Craig, how would you recommend that? Did you want to share your email even now? Or is there, are you, uh, active on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All of those things. Uh, yeah, and certainly uh, look me up on, on LinkedIn. And I've got a lot of uh, wonderful connections on LinkedIn. Got email. Feel free to reach out to me at any time at wayfinder at telus.net. It's as simple as that. And we also have a website. So if you just Google Wayfinder Consulting Inc., you'll find me. And yeah, we've got some wonderful resources on the website and tell you a little bit of more about me and some of my adventures over the years and a few blogs, including I think one of the blogs uh, is about Wayfinder and how what that word means to me and how I came to oh, name my okay. company. Uh, yeah. So check it out. There's no commitment, no, no cost. <laughs> it's free. So for <laughs> any of the, the buyers out there who are always, uh, you know, it's uh, I love hearing from colleagues and professionals and I can't wait to get back on the, the conference circuit and to some of the, the user groups and, and the, the gatherings. So yeah, happy to uh, hear from anyone. I definitely encourage people to reach out to Craig and he, I will say, I follow him on LinkedIn and he does post a lot of good content slash you like content that I tend to enjoy. <laughs> I think is what it is too. It'll be like Craig likes so-and-so and then I'll absorb it. So even just as a passive LinkedIn follower of yours, I encourage <laughs> at least a connection. Um, yeah, I always so try I and put something you. interesting, you know, for folks yeah. uh, and, and thought provoking. It's not necessarily the be all and end all, but it's just like, yeah, that's kind yeah. of an interesting take on things. Yeah, yeah. I would say it for a consultant, you're devoid of a lot of self promotion and it's very refreshing. So <laughs> <laughs> I do recommend. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's it comes it from well. being a humble, oh. humble civil servant for so many years, I right. guess. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's ingrained still, in the, the persona. Yeah, I still wear the owner's hat, uh, even working with my clients on their projects. I, mm -hmm. you know, I still live and breathe and feel their pain and it's just part yep. of what we do. So yeah, even though, but I'm, okay. I love helping folks and uh, love working with really interesting, cool people too. So yeah. Yeah, no, it sounds like, yeah, your weeks are definitely designed now favorably then for those passions. So <laughs> that's great. Yeah, I wanted to say too, thank you so much for your time, Craig. Obviously, you're always juggling 
quite a few projects and in between your future vacation planning. (laughs) So thank you so much for taking the time today. As I mentioned, we'll probably have you back in for some auctions or another interview in some capacity. And then hopefully when we do, you're showcasing a bit of an island glow. So (laughs) Sounds great. Well, thanks for having me and great chatting with you again, Rachel. Procurement professionals like you are the lifeblood of public sector organizations dedicated not only to supporting your agency, but the constituents you serve. That's why we've created the Inside Public Procurement Podcast here at Bonfire, a unique place where you can share stories and discuss the topics that matter to public procurement pros. From digitization and the future of public procurement to ensuring a fair and transparent process, we're all about finding new strategies to help your agency succeed. Join us at GoBonfire.com to learn more. You've been listening to Inside Public Procurement by Bonfire. If you like what you've heard, make sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And if you have an idea for an episode or want to come on as a guest, email us at hello at GoBonfire.com. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.